Our next interview is with our current ABA president, Stuart Bennett. And Stuart, uh, would you tell us a little bit about your background, uh, family, schools, where you grew up, uh, and that kind of stuff? Um, I'm a native Southern Californian. Um, fourth generation, if you wow. can believe it. Uh, grew up in Pasadena, was born in Los Angeles, grew up in Pasadena. And uh, uh, around age 12, I, um, I discovered the joys of uh, used and rare books walking home from my junior high school in Pasadena. And I started collecting Jack London novels, which in you know, 1961, 1962, you could get first editions. I remember very clearly, you could get first editions for a buck and a half. Um, uh, White Fang cost me seven fifty, and The Call of the Wild I could never afford. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I know the feeling. And uh, uh, my, my parents were not collectors, uh, but there had been collectors in my family. And my mother, finally, my mother, who thought I was crazy and wanted to know why I was asking for rides out to the second-hand bookshops in Glendale and Hollywood and stuff like that, uh, instead of just going down and buying a paperback. And finally dawned on her that, that one of her favorite uncles had been a collector and had, a, had bought all of Edgar Rice Burroughs' novels as they came out, the Tarzans and the John Carter of Mars and so forth. And, uh, <clears throat> and, and he'd saved the dust jackets and the whole thing. And then when he died, his kids, who thought he was crazy, um, let the local junk dealer come and take them all away and kept the leather-bound Harvard classics. <laughs> Okay, we know who was the crazy one. Right? <laughs> yeah, we know who the crazy one was. And um, I never looked back. Uh, I, I uh, went to high school in Pasadena. I had a, a year uh, college in the East, transferred back to the University of California, um, and graduated early and did two years studying in England, which is where I discovered um, auction houses. <laughs> Yes, I suppose you would. Yeah, and um, and I went went through a, an incredibly long and arduous process, actually getting hired by Park Burnett, as it then was. Um, and the reason that I got hired, I I am sure I can't document it, but I think what happened was that I I pestered them for such a long time <laughs> that they gradually <coughs> passed passed me from one department and one sale room to another. Um, in England, I was actually offered a, a, a menial job, and they couldn't get me a work permit. Yeah. So then they had a little dossier on me from London in, in um, America. Uh, I interviewed in Los Angeles, which had a Sotheby's, Sotheby yeah. Park Burnett then. And they said, well, we don't have anything for you. So they kicked the buck back to New York. So by the time New York actually <coughs> talked to me a year and a half later, wow. they had a little file. And somebody must have thought that somebody in the hierarchy thought they should try to offer me a job, that I might be important or I might be connected or something like that, none of which was true. Um, but I landed a cataloger trainee job in the book department in New York in 1974 when, and, and, and the major part of my brief, because Park Burnett was never very fond of books, um, they wanted photography sales. So I launched the photography sales in 74. Who was the um, head honcho in those days? Was it John Marion? John Marion was the, the head honcho, and Gabriel Austin was running the book department. Yeah. yeah. A hundred years ago. <laughs> but we remember these things. Yeah, well, you know, it's, it's part of our heritage, yep. et cetera. Um, you are a specialist in um, continental books, no. would you say? No. Oh, no, no. Um, I, I, when I did my catalog one in 1980, I had some continental books in there. Um, because I thought, you know, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm coming out, starting on my own. Let me see what happens. And, um, and the thing that happened that I learned very fast was that, uh, and I don't know whether it was my cataloging, I don't know whether it was karma, but people bought English books from me. Mm. And English books were what I loved best anyway. So over the years, um, I think probably I've established myself as, a, as an English literature pre-1850. Um, one of the jokes I always share with John Crichton um, is that uh, John, John knows everything I know about English literature before 1850, but he does American books and modern books and God knows what else. And, uh, and I just you know, dig my little hole deeper and deeper 
for all time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> John's, John's a great guy. I always, I always like him. Uh, when you first started out, uh, were there any dealers who or, or mentors to you, dealers who you could go to and say, gee, uh, what's your advice about this? Did you have that kind of a relationship with anyone? Very much so. Oh. Uh, but I, I um, when I decided to start my own business, I went back to England to do it. And so the mentors that I had um, in my early years um, on my own were people like Hans Fellner, who'd been an independent dealer but then became, uh, and in my time uh, working at, at uh, Christie's, because I went from Sotheby's to Christie's in 1976. Um, Hans, Hans was a mentor. Um, I, I don't think I've ever met anybody who knew more about more kinds of books than Hans Fellner. He was an incredible polymath. And it was he who, who got me started on that game of walking into a, a library and looking at a book on the shelf and without pulling the book off the shelf or looking at a label. You know, this only really worked with unlabeled bindings. Right. Um, where was the book produced? What was the what? Where did the binding come from, yeah. and when was it put on? And if we weren't within about a decade, that wasn't good enough. Yeah. <laughs> he was a tough taskmaster. He huh? was a good. He was a good tough taskmaster. Uh, uh, Martin Hamlin of Peter Murray Hill Rare Books yeah. a, a, was a great mentor, um, and there were, uh, and I think probably the most knowledgeable and uh, of American book dealers. I just, I, I, I can't say um, enough about how much I admire him. It's Steve Weissman at Simonies. A lot of people do. Yeah. Um, and Steve, of course, has an eidetic memory. Yeah. Um, I mean, a, a, a classic eidetic memory. I played bridge with him once. Uh-oh. And, um, and he had, I had watched, it was at his club in New York, and he said, well, you better come and watch us play. We'll, we're going to play duplicate for master points. And I watched him play with his partner. And they played a dozen hands. The next day, we played a dozen hands uh, with his partner. The day before, he came, they came in first. With me, we came in next to last. <laughs> <laughs> well, that says something about his partner, doesn't it? <laughs> it says a lot. Of, uh, and, um, and, and, I, and I reminded Steve of a bridge hand he had played with his partner the day before, after we'd played 12 hands. Steve could remember not only the bidding, the progress of the bidding, but the fall of the every cards. card. Yeah. That's an incredible memory. I've never been able to sell him a book I wanted to get rid of. <laughs> right now he's having some back problems. Right? Yeah, I know he is. Yeah. How long did you work at the various auction galleries before? You said you made your, your initial move in 1980 as a bookseller yeah. in, in England. Yeah. But how many years did you work for us? Park Burnett and how many years for Christie's? I was two years with, with Park Burnett and, and uh, four with Christie's. Did you uh, get to handle a lot of great things? Um, I handled some wonderful things, both in terms of books and, and photographs. Um, the, the photograph m- market in the 70s was, was really exciting yeah. because of the, uh, it, was, um, it was new enough that there were still things coming out of the woodwork that nobody Nobody knew. I mean, I was at Christie's, and, and somebody walked in with what had pretty clearly been a, a custom-made box um, that was this deep with Julia Margaret Cameron photographs, the big, wow. the big ones. And um, uh, somebody else, uh, uh, I remember a, uh, an elderly lady coming in, and she had a daguerreotype from 1843 that had been the model for a woodcut that had been made for the Illustrated London News in 1843. So it was precisely datable. Hmm. And the, the figures in the photograph were available. And I think it still stands as the first, the first image to show the act of photography. It was wow. a self-portrait of the guy at his daguerreotype camera. Yeah. Um, and, I, and, and I said, you know, this is the most exciting thing I've ever seen. I still remember her saying, I said, this is the most exciting thing I've ever seen. This is going to make a lot of money. And she said, don't you let my ex-husband know about this. I said, I know who he is. I promise I won't tell. <laughs> well, one of, the, one of the things that people used to always say is that if you worked for an auction gallery, you got to handle a tremendous amount of material and learn a great deal yeah. just by watching who's bidding, what the bids are, and condition, et cetera. Uh, 
there's a lot of things that happened in the book business since guys like you and I started in it. And I guess the main thing is the internet. And um, do you have a presence? How do you feel about the internet? Is it a boon or is it a bad thing? And uh, what exactly is your you know, <coughs> business you may do on the internet versus other things? I, I think I have to say right at the outset that I'm old fashioned about the internet, um, it, which is maybe one way of saying that um, I'm not very good at it. I don't have a natural affinity for it. Some of, some of our colleagues at our age have a natural affinity for it. Um, I, I, you know, came to it sort of kicking and screaming, regretting the loss of collegiality, regretting the, the way that it affected um, the book buying you could do on the road, that, you know, people would put things up on the Internet, so there was nothing new to look at when you got to somebody's shop. There was no reward for going on the road. Right, right. And, um, and, you know, I've come around gradually to believing that it's got its advantages. Um, certainly has its advantages as I get older and creakier and stiffer that I don't have to run around as much yeah. if I can pay attention and, and, and learn some of the tricks of finding things on the Internet, that it's a, it can be a good way to buy stock. Um, but I'm old-fashioned in the sense that, um, for me, the Internet is where I put the books that I haven't sold out of my catalogs, my printed catalogs. Okay. So your unsold stuff is rather on the internet rather than your fresh stuff. Right. Once in a while, fresh stuff, but mostly... What percentage of, of your total business emanates from the internet, sales-wise? In terms of actual um, dollar amounts, yeah, sales? Yeah, yeah. Not, um, not quantity of books, but just yeah. the dollar amount. Uh, less than 10%. Really? Yeah. What is your main vehicle? Uh, printed catalogs, quotations. Okay. How many catalogs a year do you issue? I try to do three. Um, I didn't push it. I didn't push it this year because business was down, and um, and I found that you know it just made more sense not to, uh, well, partly to not to incur the expense of printing a catalog and not to, not to incur the depression that might result from it not doing very well. Um, one of the things that um, I, I often ask uh, booksellers is. If you were entering the book trade today, would you? And if you did, how would you do it? That's a great question. Uh, uh, I don't think I'd, I, I think I'd, I'd do it. Um, but of course, the, the, the modifying the question a little bit for my own purposes. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, the, I think it's in, 19, in 2009, I was about to say 19. In 2009, um, I think there are so many things that are tougher about making a start in the book trade uh, than there were in, you know, 1979 when I was making the decision to start up on my own. Um, the the material is tougher to get hold of. The kinds of books, the earlier books that I like, uh, that I want to deal in, that I'm good at dealing in, that I have a customer base for um, are are so much more expensive that if I were starting with um, the I think I had about five or six thousand dollars when I was I had my own little book collection um, which wasn't worth a whole lot and it was mostly English poetry and I think I had five or six thousand dollars to put into stock and um, and I managed to get two catalogs out. Got my catalog one out, which took up that chunk of money, and then I quickly rotated that um, into into catalog two, which I got out as fast as I could. And 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 I was building. Um, I mean, there were there were times I can still remember um, living in West London, putting a 17th century book in this beat up old briefcase that I had, and going down and getting the number nine. Hammersmith bus to Piccadilly Circus and getting off the bus and going into Bernard Quaritch and shamelessly peddling that book because there was the gas and electricity bill unpaid. Yeah. <laughs> as, as it is with so many of us. And I think that, that for somebody in that position, that financially, which, which I was, um, I scraped by in 1979 and I you know, developed a business in the material that I care about 
Um, and, and I've lived off of it. And my stock's better now than it was in 1979. And that's, I think, you know, I can't ask for much more than that. I don't know that I could pull it off if I were starting as a, you know, 30-year-old in, 19, yeah. in 2009. 2009. Yeah. Uh, would you have called yourself a runner um, in those it, early days? Uh, certainly I was a runner when I put the book in my briefcase <laughs> and ran it over to Quaritch. Yeah. Um, Did but, you do this often or just on occasion? That was, that, those were dire straight Okay. Runs. I, 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 I had ambitions. I had pretensions. I wanted to be a catalog bookseller. I wanted to have. I had scholarly pretensions. I wanted to produce catalogs that people would 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 read and, and acknowledge as as useful in their in their fields. Um, when did you move back to Southern California? Um, well, I'm in Northern California. In Northern um, I moved. Um, I was married to an American woman living in England, and she was a museum curator and couldn't work as a curator in England because they're civil service jobs restricted to the Brits. Really? Oh. So in 1989, she got a job in, uh, at the, the Gibbs Art Gallery in Charleston, South Carolina. And we moved to Charleston. Lovely city, but it's boring. There aren't any books. Sherman's army chaplains stole all the books, and the rest of them, Sherman's, Sherman burned. And there are no decent book sales in the area. Either. It was tough. Um, and uh, and then my wife wanted to quit the job, and I got a little desperate, and that's that was my midlife crisis, 1989. And after six months of of, of coming and going and tearing my hair and renting office space in Charleston, I said, "The hell with it! I got to get a real job." And I went to law school, and I put myself through law school, um, and uh, with uh, on the proceeds of the book business, and then I moved. Um, my wife and I broke up, and I got a job with a law firm in San Francisco. And I moved to San Francisco, and um, I remember going into John Crichton's office at the Brick Row Bookshop and saying, John, I'm, I've, I've got a job with a law firm. I'm going to be a full-time lawyer. I've got to resign from the ABAA. And John said, well, you know, Stuart, I'm the, I'm the secretary, and, I, um, and I'm the chair of the membership committee. So you're going to have to send me your resignation letter. And I said, I know. That's why I'm telling you this. And he said, and uh, I'm just going to take your letter and tear it up yeah. throw it away. <laughs> so save your, save your save efforts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no sympathy. <laughs> no sympathy at all. And uh, so, I, so I worked um, full-time as a lawyer for a year and then went part-time for a couple more years. And in 1995, with a great sigh of relief, I went inactive and back to the book business. And so I've been a full-time bookseller in the Bay Area since 1995. Did you remarry? I did. Any children? Yeah, got a 16-year-old son. Does he have any interest in the book business? He, uh, he worked for me for the first time at the San Francisco Book Fair. He toddled around as a toddler. Yeah, and, well, yeah. and, I, and I learned a very, very interesting thing about perspective at book fair. If you're, if you're chasing around after a, a two-year-old, you really get to know the books on the lower, <laughs> part, lower <laughs> levels of display cases. <laughs> and, but he worked for me this past February at the San Francisco Book Fair. And, um, and I think he really surprised himself at how interesting he found it. Really? Yeah. So you, you, you may have an offspring who may take over the business? Or? I, no. I think... Um, I, I, I don't think for one second he's going to take over the okay. business. But he enjoyed the, he enjoyed yeah, he the people. He had a good time. He en and you know, I think the thing that really got him was, that, uh, was just how eclectic a mix of people there are, both in the book trade and coming to these coming book fairs, into, and, yeah. you know, and particularly in San Francisco. Yeah, well, yeah, San Francisco is very eclectic. <laughs> yeah, he loved it. So that was great. Oh, that, that's great. Yeah. That's really good. Um, what do you think are some of the great challenges we have to face, Stuart, as we look forward, you know, maybe 10, 12 years in the future? Will we have a business? And if so, how is it going to look? Well, it's, it's, a, it's, it's to, to my perspective now, having been ABA president now for coming up for two years, um, I, I, I think there's going to be a business in 10 or 12 years. Um, but the ABAA is going to look very, very different. How do you mean? Um, the, 
The ABAA celebrated its 60th anniversary this year. It was founded in 1949. And as far as I can tell, without actually asking people, but my sense is that probably the association is just a little younger than the average age of its members. We are, uh, we're not even, we're not just a graying association. We are a, a, we are becoming an elderly association. And, um, you know, you and I are still active. You're a little older than I am. Probably a lot older than you are. Well, we're, who's counting? Yeah, we're not really. <laughs> um, and in 10 years, you know, I, I'm going to be about to turn 70 in 10 years. Um, and you're going to be towards the end of your 70s, middle of your 70s? I'll be, in 10 years, I'll be 80. Okay. You're 10 years older than I am. You and I are both going to be a little less active. I don't know about you. I won't be. <laughs> I'll still be doing these interviews. <laughs> there, <probably. laughs> there we go. But, but I think that we're going to see we're going to see a whole different perspective of these things. And I don't know. I, you know, when when our average age is say sixty, let's just call it that yeah. for a moment. Um, doing a a three day book fair is one thing. What about when the average age of, of the membership is seventy? You know, and how, how many of us are there going to be? How many of us are going to go inactive? How many of us who are at the older a- end of that are going to, you know, really be inactive? Um, have, uh, has the ABAA made any kind of a survey as to um, age? How many of you are under 30? How many are under 40? How many are under 50? How many, how many are under 60? Well, it, it, it would require, you know, actually asking members questions that we probably wouldn't, couldn't reasonably expect answers or honest answers to. Um, so my, you know, having, having knocked around the business for quite a while and been on the Board of Governors now for almost 10 years, yeah. and, you know, and you've been around this business a long time, we both, if, 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 we, if, if we say to ourselves, how many ABA members do we know who are under 30? I think the answer is none. Uh, I don't think I know anyone under 30. Um, and there may be uh, maybe five or six under 40. It's possible. Um, and I would say maybe maybe even 15 or 20 under 50. I've always had the impression, uh, not always, but recently, that about 10 to 12 percent of our membership is under 50, and the balance is over 50. I mean, like you say, we're an organization that's aging. Mm-hmm. Uh, but how do we get fresh blood? How do we how do we make this uh, entity attractive for people under fifty to want to belong and, and be a bookseller? I think the I, I I think the wanting to be a bookseller in some ways takes care of itself. Mm-hmm. I th- I think the ABAA's historically I think the ABAA failed to be as um, aggressive as it could have been. In, um, in expanding its uh, book fair schedule, um, reaching out to younger dealers by having maybe tiers of membership where you could, you know, join join the association uh, at a at a, uh, as a as a younger bookseller or as a less experienced bookseller, and you'd have access to maybe one tier of less expensive regional fairs, and then you could graduate. You know, there are a lot of different ways you could approach it to to make the association more immediately attractive for, for members. And I think that, that I remember, do you remember Winnie Myers, the sure. autograph dealer in yeah, London? In London yeah. uh, I remember, oh, I don't know, because I, I was a member f- of the English Antiquarian Booksellers yeah. Association, and I remember fairly early on in my, my career, Winnie saying to me, young man, you should join the association. And I made the mistake of saying, well, I'm just not sure that joining the ABAA would, would do anything really positive for my business. And she said, that is the wrong approach. She was right. You need to ask what you can do for the association. And I think that that is um, a really essential aspect of it. But it does need to cut both ways. And I think one of the things that we've forgotten is that that there were a lot of 
things that we might have been able to do for young booksellers. And I think those young booksellers are getting what they need um, from associations like Mary Abbott, Midwest Booksellers Association, yeah. uh, and and all those independent fair promoters that are offering that are offering one day, two day book fairs yeah. for you know really a, a, a fraction um, of of what the ABAA charges, and um, and they and you know dealers at the ABA get a lot more, and we are in a we are rightly perceived as being in a whole different echelon of the trade. But by, by making those two echelons uh, so distinct, I think we've cut off some of the possibilities for people to move ladder, so to speak. We're, I'm mixing my metaphors here from one ladder, uh, up the ladder from one echelon to another. God help me. I better, maybe we should stop right there. But historically, as, as I recall, historically over the past 10 or 15 years, the mention of a two-tiered or a three-tiered system has met with great, a great deal of animosity by the Board of Governors. Oh, I think it would be, it, you know, it would be like uh, trying to take Martin Luther to see the Pope. Yeah. Just, um, uh, and I can't understand it, frankly, because the, our business depends upon new members and youth, and uh, yet we're, we're doing everything we possibly can to discourage those people from being members. In, in the name of maintaining our standards. Wow. And I will be perfectly candid and say that I, my personal feeling is we'll maintain our standards and sometime in the course of the next 10 to 15 years, um, unless there are major changes, I, I see an implosion coming and a lot of my colleagues in the ABAA saying, what happened? Right. Well, right now there's a, 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 an undercurrent uh, of feeling, bad feeling, about the ILAB. And the undercurrent mainly is that many people are being taxed $50 a booth, the money going to the ILAB, and many people have come to me and said, what are we getting for the amount of money that we're spending, which is approximately 35% of the annual budget of ILAB, yet we only have the same amount of votes at the ILAB as somebody who's proceeding with 10%. I have an, an immediate answer to that, mm -hmm. I'm glad to say, and one of the things that, because uh, uh, I've just come back from the um, president's, president's meeting in Vienna, and uh, Adrian Harrington, who's the ILAB president, um, who's uh, you know, one of the mainstays of the ABA and has been a oh, fair yeah. organizer for the Olympia Fair and is a, a great guy, yeah. has had a, a, a brilliantly forward-looking approach to a lot of things ILAB, but most particularly the iLab's presence on the internet and what we're going to see, one of the things we're going to be seeing for those uh, book fair levies that go to iLab uh, come December 2nd, 2009 is going to be the, um, the iLab meta search, which is taking what I think is a, a, a great new approach to the internet and to members of the iLab, all of the iLab, um, and that is you're going to be on the internet, booksellers. There's no escape. Right. You choose where you want your books on the internet. You get your books and in a database um, on your own website, on a collective website of your choosing, whether it's abaa.org or or Livre Rare Book in France or or Biblio or Abe. And it's not our business as iLab to tell you where what commercial decisions you make about listing your books. But one of, the, one of the paybacks you get as an iLab member is anybody who searches on iLab.org, if you can have your books either on your own website or your commercial website provider in a format that we can search, we'll search them and we'll deliver results on iLab.org. And it's going to be the best uh, search engine for... Um, reliable booksellers, iLab members in the business. It's going to do, you know, it, it really, I think, is going to make a huge change. Um, and I think that's worth every penny. Okay. How do you feel about those who say that uh, Americans, Australians, Japanese uh, associations pay for their members, uh, their presidents, to go to presidents' meetings, while all the Europeans don't? They use iLab, ILAB funds to go to the functions. Um, 
That's the first I've heard of it. Okay. I didn't know that. Well, that, that's one of the things that, that a lot of people are objecting to. Uh, I, I'm not, I, I, I mean, I'd have to ask Adrian Harrington. At the Madrid meeting, I, there, were, there was some discussion of, um, of covering ILAB officers, committee members, and so right. forth, traveling expenses, and right. so forth. And, um, and it was discussed, and, uh, and I made a point that um, I thought that the, uh, that the, that there was an element of giving back on the part of ILAB committee members and officers, and that while it was appropriate to defray their expenses, that it should not become a junket, and that the idea that somehow uh, that somebody actually proposed paying business class airfares yeah, for the, tourists. and um, and it all went down in smoke, and there was no there was no there was, I didn't maybe, maybe there, there are some new people who are looking at things in an entirely different way. I have I have nothing based on on my two years now of experience with I, the functions of the ILAB and the committee and the officers. I have nothing but good things to say about them. They, they work extremely hard for booksellers all over the world. Now, let me ask you one final question and I'll let you go. Um, if you were, if a young man or a young person comes to you and says, Mr. Bennett, uh, I'd like to be a bookseller, what is your advice? Um, we're talking about today, yeah. not 40 yeah. years from now or 40 years ago. Yeah. But here, we're in November of 2009. I want to be a bookseller, Mr. Bennett. What do you think? Well, my, my immediate response right away, and I've had the question asked, and I always say, what kind of books do you love and how much do you love them? Yeah. And if you really love them, and if, you're, if, if, if you wake up thinking, what kind of books can I find today? And, and if, if your idea of a business is being forced to sell some of your books in order to buy more, then this may be the, this may be the trade for you. <laughs> Great. Thanks very much, Stuart. I appreciate it. Mike, it was a pleasure.